Okay, so uh, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Stephanie Stickney and I'm the Assistant Director of PGE. Thank you to Dr. Moore for holding this session today. Dr. Moore is the Vice President for Diversity and Community Engagement and the George Littlefield, Littlefield Professor of American History at the University of Texas at Austin. He's a native of Cleveland, Ohio and earned his BA from Jackson State University and his PhD from Ohio State University. He has been at the University of Texas since 2007. At UT Austin, he teaches a class on, black, on the Black Power Movement and his signature course titled Race in the Age of Trump. In the fall semester, he teaches more than a thousand students across both courses. Dr. Moore is the author of three books, one of which was nominated for the 2002 NAACP Image Award for Best Nonfiction Book. He's currently working on a biography of Adam Clayton Powell Jr., the controversial uh, pastor, congressman, and civil rights leader. Moore is also active in the Austin community and currently serves as chairman of the board of the Austin Area Urban League. Um, his research interests are modern American history, black urban history, intersections of race, sports, and hip hop. Thank you again, Dr. Moore. Before I hand it over, I just want to go over the agenda for today. Dr. Moore will present till 1 p.m., during which time the chat feature will be turned off. Then we'll have a Q&A from 1 to 125. We'll all turn the chat feature, feature back on. Everyone, please keep, your, uh, keep yourselves muted until that time. And without further ado, take it away, Dr. Moore. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, one, one, one slight correction. I probably won't go for a full hour, all right? <laughs> I maybe go around 30, 35 minutes or so, and then we can get the question and answer. Is that okay with you? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah I'm sure. Okay, I'm all right, yeah. yeah Q&A would, would, be, would be appreciated too. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, I mean, because I really want to get your thoughts, you know, so I'll have some things I want to say, but I really want to, want to get your thoughts. Well, good afternoon. Thank you all for, thank you all for having me. Um, it's an interesting time in America. Uh, I know some people are excited about the election. Some people are, I don't, you know, some people may be uh, depressed about the election, but nonetheless, you know, there, there seems to be a spirit of optimism in America, particularly around age, race issues. And the reason, you know, we want to do this session today, because I think, you know, we, we, there are a lot of diversity initiatives going on around in higher ed and in the corporate space. And I always remind people, <clears throat> you know, I always remind other chief diversity officers, you know, in your initiatives, don't forget about black people. And when I say that, they, they're kind of taken away. And the reason I say don't forget about black people, because I think that often what I've seen happen is that other issues of diversity become a priority. And then the critical issues of race and ethnicity never get addressed, never get addressed. And I think, you know, we can talk about gender, you can talk about sexuality. Um, and again, some people, those are controversial, but I think whatever, whatever it is, when it comes to talking about, particularly I would say black people, and in Texas, black people and Mexican Americans, there's always a level of discomfort. There is always a level of discomfort. And, you know, and I don't, I don't get into the hierarchies of oppression. I don't get into that. But I think just, you know, the, 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 the context of UT and where we are, um, and we understand that UT did not admit African-Americans till 1956. I mean, I, I really all, always tell people, starting with black people is always a good place to sort of begin these, these initiatives and things of that nature. So that's what, we'll, that's what we'll try to do today. So let me say this. I don't speak for all black people. I don't. Uh, my sister voted for Trump in 2016, and Amy, we were together for Thanksgiving in Louisiana in 2018, and she told the family she voted for Trump. The, it's like, it was like something out of a, it was like, it was like everything started moving in slow motion. Like everybody just kind of just like stopped and looked. So again, I say that we all don't, again, we all don't, uh, I don't speak for all black people. Now I will say this though, I believe that my, I'm in the mainstream of black thought, I will say that, I, I'm not far out there. Um, but again, I don't, I don't speak for all black. So a couple of things just, just, just off top. So I, so I always ask people, you know, where they're, you know, to describe the neighborhood they grew up in. And because many of us don't realize, you know, you know, a lot of our views now were shaped in childhood. I grew up in a community that was about 40% black, 30% white, but also 30% Orthodox Jewish. 
all right? I'm from a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio, and that has shaped me in so many different ways. I remember playing shirts versus skins, shirts and skins basketball with my Jewish friends, and they had on yarmulkes. You know, Friday night, we're walking up to go to the high school football game or the basketball game. My Jewish friends walking up to go to the synagogue. So that shaped me in many ways. So then I went to school in Jackson, Mississippi for four years, a historically black college university in Jackson, Mississippi. I tell people it wasn't ranked then. It's not ranked now. But HBCUs have, have been doing the work of getting people educated since the 1880s and 1890s, all right? Um, then, then I got a PhD at Ohio State um, in 1998. So I've been a professor for about 23. This is my 23rd year uh, in the classroom as a professor. I spent nine years at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge, and I've been here for the last 14. So this is my 14th year at the University of Texas. Now, one of the big reasons we have issues uh, dealing with understanding the Black experience is because we live in different worlds. We could live in complete. I was talking to somebody the other day about the eyes of Texas controversy. And this person said, he said, Leonard, do many like black people realize that for a lot of white people in Texas, you know, we've sung this song at funerals and weddings and at birthday parties. And I said, no. And I said, but I don't think many white people in Texas understand that the song has been talked about by black people at this university for close to 35, 40 years. And it's nobody's fault, it's just that we operate in two completely different worlds. Now, I'll give an example. I did a presentation for the National Association of Realtors uh, last week, and Amy, you'll appreciate this. You know, me and my wife, whenever we have sold our house, we sold two houses in Baton Rouge. Whenever we sold our house, the first thing we had to do, we had to de-blacken our house, all right? Let me tell you what this means. As a black homeowner, we understand that most white people would not buy a house from a black person. We just understand that we don't have to be told it. And so what most black homeowners do before they get ready to put their house on the market, they take down all the black pictures. They get rid of all the black magazines. Remember the Ebony magazines back in the day, Amy? Those big ones, all right? They get rid of all the black magazines and they get rid of anything, anything that, that can signal to the potential home buyer that this is an African-American family, all right? Now, when I tell my white friends this, they don't understand it, but this is just common knowledge to us. So we'll take the black pictures down, we'll put up pictures of white people, we'll go buy some magazines, Mademoiselle, Vogue, Men's Health, because we, 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 we can't give them this idea that it is owned by a black person. And when I tell my white friends this, they can't believe it, but it's the truth. Also, as it relates to, as it relates to home ownership, check this out. Many of you, you know, may have gotten your house refinanced before. You know, they have to come out do an appraisal. But as a black person, we understand instinctively when the appraiser comes to your house to give the appraise, to appraise the property, make sure you are not home. Because we believe if the appraiser understands that the house is owned by a black family, the house will appraise for significantly less than market value. And I see Mike shaking his head. Yes, this is, we live in different worlds, okay? Let, let, me, let me bring it closer to home. My daughter's just started driving. I have a daughter in college in San Antonio. She's been driving for a while, and I have a daughter, 11th grader. And, you know, police brutality is real to us, you know? And so what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to do it when, they, when my daughter comes on Thanksgiving, I'm going to go buy them two Texas X's um, car medallions, and I'm going to put it on the back of each of their cars. And here's why. My wife's from Los Angeles. She went to UCLA as an undergrad. And she talked about all the harassment she received from the LAPD. She said she knew at one point they were going to sexually violate her. She said the only thing that saved her was the fact that she told them she was a student at UCLA. All right? I told my colleagues uh, this summer that, you know, every day when I drive, I live in Round Rock, when I drive from Round Rock to campus, and a police officer gets behind me, I literally get terrified. I literally get terrified whenever a police officer gets behind me. Not based upon what I've seen on TV, not based upon what people have told me, but based upon what I have experienced in my own life, okay? Um, I was stopped outside of Dallas about four years ago by a police officer. He said he wanted to search the car for drugs and weapons, all right? Uh, I was also stopped, me and my family were coming from the, back from the Grand Canyon. I was stopped by an officer. I said, officer, why'd you pull me over? He said, because when you change lanes, 
you didn't give the 18 wheeler enough, uh, enough space in front of you. And the officer proceeded to ask me the following questions. Where do you work? Are you tenured? What classes do you teach? What kind of car do you drive? What does your wife do for a living? What kind of car does she drive? Then he tells me, Mr. Moore, I need you to get in the front seat of the police car with me, uh, please. So I, me and him are sitting in the front seat, and there are two German shepherds behind me for about 15 or 20 minutes. Now, here's what I tell people. I have come to expect that. Do I believe all cops are bad? Not at all. But I believe that if the good cops don't snitch on the bad ones, then they are, then they are complicit in the harassment and the discriminatory treatment, all right? So I've come to expect that of the police. I, that's, and it's funny, I teach a class in a law school every spring semester. There's a white kid in my class, and I said, okay, we're going to go around the classroom, and I want you to talk about the experiences you've had with the police. This kid was 28 years old, third-year law student, he said throughout his lifetime, he had never had any interaction with the police. I said, hold on a minute. Not even positively or not? He said, not at all. That completely blew me away. All right? So we just live in different worlds. I was at a faculty senate meeting three years ago, Amy. Shaka Smart, the basketball coach, was there talking about how the season and, and sort of his academic, his academic philosophy with his guys. Now, there are three black people in the, in the entire room. It's up in the tower, second floor of the tower. Three black people in the room. Me, my colleague from the College of Ed, Lewis Harrison, and Shaka Smart. All right? Now, listen to this now. When the event is over, people are standing around talking. There are a group of white professors uh, to the left of me. One of them points at me, and I overhear him telling his colleagues, well, you may want to ask him because he's an assistant basketball coach. That he's referring to me, all right? I've, I've had an endowed professorship for about five or six years, but again, it doesn't matter. The one perk of my job that I have that I really enjoy, I can park anywhere on campus, anywhere on campus, all right? Now, I typically park right by the tower. That's where my office is. Do you know on two occasions, when I've pulled into, into the spot by the tower with my old sticker, the parking people have yelled at me and told me, you can't park there? Because they see me, I'm black, and they just assume he wouldn't have an O sticker. And then when they see the O sticker, now it's come to, now we got to have a come to Jesus meeting now. But that has happened on two occasions. There have been times I've been to UT events. I show up, they give me the name badge of another black person. I'm like, hell, it only, it only, it's only four of us here. You can't even get, get our names right. But it happens frequently, frequently. And so sometimes I ask my, my white colleagues, I said, throughout the course of a day, how often do you think about race? They'd be like, I don't think about it at all. You don't have to. But I think about it 24 seven. Um, a couple years ago, I, I was invited up to uh, Appalachian State University to speak up in Boone, North Carolina, all right? So I had my secretary made all the travel arrangements for me, and the plane left on a Sunday afternoon, like at 4 or 5 o'clock. I just assumed that the university was somewhere not too far from Charlotte off a major interstate, all right? I didn't really look at the little Google Maps thing she had printed out until it was like 30 minutes for me to go to the airport, and I was like, damn, I got to change clothes. When I looked at the map, Yes, it's, it's a couple hours outside of Charlotte, but you're only on a major interstate for about 30 minutes. And after that, it's like 90 minutes, rural North Carolina. And I was like, hell no, I got to go change clothes. So what I do, what I did, I have some UT Nike coaches gear. <laughs> Amy's laughing. Um, got a little polo shirt with a Nike sign, a little Nike pullover, the Longhorn logo here, the Nike logo here. Uh, put on some khaki pants and a longhorn hat. And people say, but well, Leonard, why did you dress like that? Because I had to think about what happens if I get pulled over in rural North Carolina late at night by a white state trooper or a white police officer. And my rationale for the way I dressed is that, you know, men bond over sports, is that that person would see all the longhorn stuff it would put the police officer at ease. We could have a discussion about sports, and he may give me a ticket, but I would make it to Boone 
uh, uh, I'll make it to Boone on time. I'll make it to Boone that night. But I have to think about also, where do I put my wallet at? I never drive on the highway with my wallet in my back pocket. Hell, I don't even drive on the highway at night, period. So I'm, sometimes I'll put my wallet on the dashboard, or sometimes I will put it in the trunk of the car, plain and simple. I don't put it because there have been too many cases of black people going for their driver's license and, and the officers assuming that they'll get shot, okay? Now, so again, we live in different worlds. And here's what I tell people. You know, when people are telling you their experience, don't tell them it ain't true. Don't tell them it ain't true. Well, with Dr. Moore, people, people, fab, people fabricate stuff all the time, right? But typically, black folk don't, we don't make up a lot of the racial stuff we deal with. In fact, I don't think we talk about it enough, all right? Now, let me pivot a little bit. Most white Americans don't understand black frustration because in their mind, a lot of the racial stuff was handled with a lot of the civil rights legislation in the late 60s, early 70s. All right, so if you're a typical white person walking around Austin, Texas, you will not see any racial discrimination. You won't see any. And so when black people talk about it, like, well, I don't see it. Of course you wouldn't see it because you don't live it. All right. I want to talk about two, two particular instances why I like living in the South. It relates to this. I was at my daughter's, uh, my daughter used to be in gymnastics cheer. That stuff is expensive as hell, by the way. Um, so I remember about five, six years ago, we're in San Antonio at a, at an event and it's me, some of the other parents are there and I'm talking, it's a white parent, white guy, we talk. And it's always interesting when um, white people in Texas ask me what I do for a living, all right? It's, it's always interesting. I say, well, I work at the University of Texas, all right? Then the, 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 when I say that, they immediately go to athletics, all right? Remember my neighbor said, well, Leonard, what are you doing in athletics? I'm like, Hell, I'm Mac Brown. I'm Charlie Strong. I don't know, okay? But, I'm, but I don't work in athletics, all right? That's, that's the first card they go to, all right? So when I'm telling them I'm a professor, the thing is interesting, then of course the, the, the natural follow-up question is, well, what classes do you teach, all right? And this could be a Saturday Night Live skit. I say, well, I teach two classes, one called Race in the Age of Trump, another class, uh, History of the Black. And when I say that, it is a very awkward pause because they don't know how, they don't know they don't know how to follow up. They do not know how to follow up, all right? And then if I tell them, you know, I'm also in this vice president role, and they say, oh, vice president of what? I say diversity and community engagement, and the pause is even longer, all right? So anyway, we're at this cheer event. I tell this other dad that, and then like 45 minutes later, he comes and said, we said, Leonard, uh, he said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, but, you know, I don't want to offend you. And what I have learned, Gary, is that when somebody says, they don't want to offend you. That means they, they're about to. They're about to offend you. So, so here's what this dad says. He, he, his daughter was in Westlake, Westlake High School. Here's what he says. He says, well, uh, Leonard, uh, he said, you know, I really wish y'all would do something about that uh, top 10%, top 8% rule. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, my daughter is at a competitive high school, but she's not, you know, top 8%, but she's in a lot of AP classes. You know, but she, if she was at an inner city high school, or one of those high schools along the border, she would be valedictorian. And he said, I think y'all are letting in way too many unqualified black and Mexican students. That's what he said, straight out of his mouth. I'm, I'm not offended at all, he's being straight. And I said, you know what, man, that's an interesting perspective. I said, but I would argue that if your daughter was at an inner city high school or a school along the, the border, her whole life would be different. He never, he never, he, he couldn't even conceive of that, right? But his mind is, let me take my daughter and go put her in inner city high school. I said, man, her whole life would be different. I, I gave a lecture to a, to a group, um, group out in Lakeway. It's called the Lakeway Men's Club, all right? And when I said Lakeway Men's Club, whatever image went into your mind, that's it. That's it, all right? <laughs> that's it. About 100 white men there. That's it. All right, that's, that, that's what the image was. That's it. So I get there, and I took two of my black male PhD students with me. I said, man, I want y'all to come see this. It's going to be interesting. I, I knew something was going to go down. Plus, I need to have some protection with me anyway, just in case something did. So anyway, I get there, and I said, I said, I said here's what we're going to do, man. We're going, we're going, we're going, I'm going to throw them a curveball. They're expecting me. They told me I could talk about whatever I want to talk about. I said, they are expecting me to talk about race, but I'm not going to do it. We're going to talk about just 
the connection between globalization and higher education. That's what we're going to talk about, all right? We're not going to say nothing about black people, nothing about Mexican-Americans, nothing about, I'm not going to utter the word diversity, not going to mention Trump's name, nothing, all right? So I speak 20 minutes, as I've talked about, uh, I spoke about 20 minutes, but check this out. Even before I said anything, as the guy got up to pass, before he introduced me, he passed out my bio, 10 people got up and walked out immediately, just walked out. I guess they said, not this morning. Got, so anyway, I talked for 20 minutes, don't say anything about race. Then the minute I, um, I say any questions, old white guy raises his hand, like 65 years old. He says, well, he says, uh, Dr. Moore, I said, yes, he said, what do you think about Black Lives Matter? I said, well, hell, I didn't say nothing about Black Lives Matter, but I, but I can tell you've been waiting for two or three years to ask that question to a black person. So go ahead. All right? I, said, well, I said, what do you think about Black Lives Matter? He said, well, if you all would obey the police, you wouldn't get shot. All right? Now, I'm not offended. I appreciate his honesty. And that's how people in Texas roll, and I like it. Because now we can have an honest conversation when you come at me like that. All right? So... Here, here's the crux of the issue. Um, many white Americans think black folk do a lot of complaining. Just complain, just complain, you know. Oh yeah, another black guy got shot by a cop. They're gonna go take to the streets again. They're gonna riot and they're gonna loot. But I don't see them getting mad when black people are killing black people in Chicago and in New York and in Dallas. And I know that's what white people say. And I, because I understand the perspective. Because in your mind, why would we get upset why, why do we get so upset at George Floyd or Michael Brown or Breonna Taylor getting killed when we got all this other killing going on? If you get nothing else from today, hear this. When, black pe when a black person kills another black person, the assailant will be in jail within 48 hours, hands down. They'll be in jail. They will be locked up. That's not happening when officers kill black people. And here's the deal. The black community has never asked for a rush to judgment. They have never asked for cops just to be immediately convicted. Damn, the black community is just like, can we at least get an indictment? Because if you say that your judicial system is fair, if you say it's fair, why are you reluctant to put the cop on trial? If you say, if you say it's fair, and that, this, and that you know, we're judged by a jury of our peers, if you say it's fair, why are you reluctant to put an officer on trial? That's what frustrates black people. Is that we got video, got all this evidence, and it's like, no, no indictment. Are you kidding me? And like these, any district attorney will tell you, um, you can get an indictment for a ham sandwich. I think that's, I think that's the, I think that's, the, I think that's the phrase they use. That the grand jury just rubber stamps what DAs want. All right. So I'm gonna show you how institutional and systemic racism operate. But again, if you don't, if you think black folk do a lot of complaining, you won't even, you can't even, you can't even fathom institutional and systemic racism. You actually believe it's something that's made up. All right. But I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take you through the death of George Floyd. We're going to go through eight steps and I'm going to show you how this one incident is a clear illustration of institutional racism and why black folks are frustrated. Okay, num number one, step number one, the police officer put his knee on the man's neck for eight minutes, 43 seconds, in broad daylight with people with cameras videoing. Video, okay? You know why? Because in his mind, I know I'm getting in trouble. This is a broad daylight on a major intersection with all kind of video cameras, uh, uh, phones taping. That's number one. Number two, Mr. Floyd slipped into unconsciousness at around minute four. Neither one of the officers attempted to render any kind of aid, although they saw the brother laying lifeless and unconscious from minute four to about to eight minutes and 43 seconds. All right? Number three, here we go. Here's the third one. Even after the paramedics arrived, the police officer kept his knee on the man's neck for an additional 60 seconds. Right? And number four, all four of the officers conspired to lie on the police report. All right? So we're going to put that in column A, or we're going to say that's column A. Let's go to column B. 
Step five. Despite video evidence, the district attorney on the night of the murder said, there is other evidence out there that does not support an indictment. Number six, the officer did not indict until about 48 to 72 hours after the incident. Officers were allowed to go home, all right? Step seven, when the DA did indict, he indicted them on lesser charge, like third degree manslaughter and second degree something else, but lesser charges, all right? So put that in column B. Column A, you got the culture of the Minneapolis Police Department, Column B, the culture of the district attorney's office. Now, here is the one here that just completely blew me away. What step we on? Step eight or nine? What step we on? Y'all follow me? What step we on? We on step, step eight? Step nine. Step nine. Here we go. Here we go. Here's the, here is the one that just blows people away. When the medical examiner released their report, medical examiner slash coroner, the medical examiner said, Mr. Floyd did not die from asphyxiation or strangulation. Said Mr. Floyd died from heart disease and something else with the heart. All right, so put that in column C. So as black people, we're looking at that. That to us is institutional racism. You got three separate entities. The Minneapolis Police Department, the district attorney's office, and the coroner, the medical examiner, all conspiring to protect the rights of one white man. One white man, three separate entities, okay? And so if this happens in liberal Minnesota with a democratic governor, with a liberal mayor, with a democratic DA, what's going on in other places, okay? So that is how institutional and systemic racism work, okay? Anybody here play Monopoly at all? Anybody here play Monopoly at all? Ever, ever played it before? Y'all good Monopoly players? I know y'all kind of nerdy, but anyway. All right, so. Can y'all see this right here? Can y'all read that? Or is it backwards? It's backwards? It's not. Y'all can see it? All right. So this is something I came up with. It's called the Monopoly Guide, Monopoly Gameplay Guide for Negro Participation. And so what I do in a lot of my trainings, what I do, I, I basically use the game of Monopoly to explain black frustration. Here we go, all right? Now, I don't know how y'all play in white, white neighborhoods, but typically, traditional way you play, everybody gets $1,500, right? You, you pick a piece, you pick the banker and all that. And the goal of the game is to, of course, buy property, bankrupt your opponents, and win the game, all right? Here's how this has worked for white folk, black folks. So imagine all of us get together, and we're gonna play Monopoly. All of us sitting down, all right? We pass out the pieces, somebody's the shoe, Somebody's gonna be the thimble, the hat, the car, the man on the horse, all that. But me and Amy sit down to play too with you all, but then we are told, ha, ah, Leonard and Amy, the, the rules are a little different for y'all. You're like, well, what are the rules? And they say, well, you all can't buy any property until you roll for the 20th time, all right? But you can go around the board, you can pay rent, of course you can pay taxes, and of course, you black, you, go, you know you're going to go to jail, all right? But you can't buy any property till you roll for the 20th time. And although everybody else gets $1,500, we're going to give you $300. And when you pass go, you don't get 200 like everybody else. You get 20, all right? So check this out. So the game is going on. Me and Amy are excited now. because Amy's one of my former students. That's why I know her so well. Um, now we're excited because I'm about to roll for the 20th time, and now we can buy some property. And I'm looking around before I roll, trying to see what property is available. But guess what? It's all gone. All the property has been bought. So although I've been at the game, I was a participant, the rules were in many ways, what? Stacked against me. And so let's say somebody else comes and observes the game and they see all the white participants with property and money and they see me and other black players sitting there with nothing. And the assumption they make is that you were lazy, you didn't want to work, you didn't want to, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't want to, you didn't, um, you didn't value buying property, you want to live off other people, you want to be on welfare. And it's like, no, I wanted to play, I wanted to participate, 
I wasn't allowed to. So check this out. At that point in the game, no matter how hard I roll the dice, I could blow on them. No matter how hard I roll the dice, no matter how much I go to school, no matter how hard I try, guess what? I will never be able to catch up. Never. There's nothing I can do. I'll never be able to catch up. And let's say, you know, the game goes on and say, well, Leonard, man, that happened a long time ago. That was three hours ago. It's like, yeah, but the present, what you see is a product of the past. All right? And most people don't understand the past because many of us never took a black history class at all. So we are ignorant, right, of this large ethnic group in the U.S. and their experiences. I, I felt so ignorant when I moved here from Louisiana because I didn't know anything about Mexican-American history. Nothing. But then I realized nobody else did either. And I'm like, that wasn't like required in high school? They don't, they don't, offer, they don't teach Mexican-American history in high school? With the, with, with the impact Mexicans have had on this part of the country? They said no. So we don't understand people's experiences. So we look at a contemporary situation and we make an assessment without understanding everything that went on behind it. Here, 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 here's what I say about University of Texas. The reason the donor base is all white and the alumni base is largely white is because for like the first 80 years of this school's existence, they made a strategic decision, strategic, to exclude one group of people, one group, black people, one group, one. And so oftentimes you, you know, so, you know, so that's why you walk around and of course all the builders gonna be named after white people, of course, because that was the history. But, but what we are seeing, and you all are in the STEM fields and I'll, I'll say this, you know, we, we talk about the legacy of, of black education and all black schooling. I mean, you know, do you realize in the state of Texas, like in 1930, the state of Texas spent like $100 on every white kid, but like $35 on every black kid? <laughs> so you're talking about inequities. You're talking about a system. My mom went to high school. My mom finished high school in 1957 in, in rural Louisiana, all right? And I went, my mom passed about two years ago, and I went and got some of her stuff. She had a report card uh, in some of her, inside her yearbook. And it had like the days she, you know, had like an attendance thing as well. Do you know my mom missed like school started mid to late August? Do you know she missed like 40 days of school between like mid August and like November 1? Anybody know why? They had to go pick cotton. <laughs> they had to go pick cotton, all right? And so, and so what we talk about black frustration is that Black people just want white people to understand the history. And I don't even go back to slavery. I don't even go back that far. I do go back to segregation and Jim Crow. I do go back to that period of time. Do y'all realize that the state of Texas was so invested in whiteness and keeping UT pure that if you were black in the 1930s, 40s, early 50s, and you wanted to get a PhD or a law degree, the university, the state of Texas would give you a scholarship to go out of state and get the degree. Here's why. Because according to the doctrine of separate but unequal, all right, the University of Texas did not have to integrate as long as it provided equal access to black people somewhere else. So at the undergrad level, we had historically black colleges. They would say, well, we have Prairie View. So they, can't, they, they don't need to come here for undergrads because we have another institution that they can go to. But when it came to getting a PhD and a law degree, the state of Texas is like, well, hell, we don't want them integrating UT. So they told black people, if, wherever you get admitted, we will pay. And that system went on for about 14, 15 years or so, all right? So now let me talk about black students a little bit and then we'll, we'll sort of wrap this up. Um, Anybody have any idea, if you're just watching a UT football game, what assumption could you make about black enrollment at UT? Just by watching a football game. If you watch the stands. What do you say? <laughs> the stands, you don't see much. Right. So, but if you're just looking at the field, what assumptions do you make? What assumptions can you make? Well, the team, of course, is mainly black. It's mainly black. Yeah. And, and here's the question. The team's about, on scholarship, about 90% black. 
and the question is, how are we 90% black on the field, but not 90% black in the classroom? Come on, y'all are smart. Help me out. Help me understand this. And why do we accept the 90% black on the field? Because it makes us money. It makes us money. Okay, but what else? Leah, that's a good point, but what else? But I don't want to, I don't know if this leads too much into it, but I have two screens here, which is why I'm looking that way. But um, I'm not sure if, Black students would be accepted or admitted into UT unless they brought some sort of dollar amount with them. That's, 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 unless that we is, saw value in them. Leah, that's that's a good point. And so the problem is, I tell people we're you know about ninety percent on the football field, women's basketball about ninety percent, men's basketball about ninety percent, but in the classroom we're five point four percent. And if you want to disaggregate the data, y'all use those big words in the sciences, right? Um, Black males do about 1.4%. 1.4% black males. 1.4% black males of the entire campus. That's, that's law school, med school, pharmacy school, undergrad, everything. 1.4%. All right? Now, most people are, can't believe it when I, when I share those numbers. Okay? Now, here's the deal. So understand, I will argue that the black students at the University of Texas, although we're small, have the, I would argue have the best support structure of any other group of black students at any large public research institution in the country. I, I believe that, all right? Hell, I built most of it, so I'm, I'm a brag on that, all right? The support structure is there. However, it does, it can become alienating. This is a big place. It is very impersonal. Um, and, and I don't know, have any of y'all worked at a historically black college before? Anybody on this call worked at an HBCU as a white person and been like the only white person in your department, the only white person in the college, and one of the few white professionals on the Uh-uh, it would be a different experience for you. So some of the things our black students wrestle with, they deal with a lot of stereotypes. It is assumed that every black male on campus is there to play a sport. I had a student who was five foot five, and people asked him what position he played, <laughs> all right? But it's just the stereotype that goes, that's one of the stereotypes that, 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 that goes along with it. Um, and so um, I think the frustration of black students here, particularly in the sciences, of not seeing enough people who look like them and particularly not seeing faculty members and graduate students who look like them. Let me tell you this quick story and then we'll get the question. This is my issue with white liberals and social justice warriors. Listen to this. All right. So I got a call one day from the dean of the law school. There was a situation over there. Some students were mad at a professor because they didn't like the question he had on his black professor. The, the woke students, and only one was black, by the way, didn't like the question this professor asked on the exam, right? And they were up in arms. They said the, 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 the question was emotionally trauma triggering to them. And the question was basically about if you had to defend school segregation from a legal perspective, how would you do it, all right? Just an academic exercise. They were up in arms, up in arms, all right? So I go over there. They want the professor, I think, detenured, something crazy. They want the professor not to be able to write out his own exam questions. Just crazy stuff. And they were up in arms. So, we, so we, we dealt with all that. And it was like six white students and one black student who were upset. So anyway, I asked the professor and the dean to leave. And I said, you know, I really appreciate you all. You know, you all are advocates. I said, how, I said help me understand this. You all seem to be more upset over the fact that this one law school question that, that deeply offended you. I said, did you all get upset that the law school only enrolled eight black students this year? And they went quiet. They got quiet, all right? And I say that because I think oftentimes on this campus, people think a lot of the activism is coming from black and brown. This Eyes of Texas stuff, those are mostly wealthy white Asian kids. Student government stopped singing the Eyes of Texas five years ago at their, at their, at their student government meetings. All right, this is not, this, I mean, look at the Black Lives Matter march and tell me who you see out there. And I remember I had a, had a kid, Amy, from India came to my office last, last fall. He was writing the story. He said, he said, Dr. Moore, he said this, he said, uh, he said, are you really committed to ending white supremacy? He asked me. <laughs> and I said, man, I've been black my whole life, all right? But typically it's these wealthy white and Asian kids who are the most active. 
They come from well-resourced families. They come from families where their parents are very well connected. And that's just them. That's the woke group. It's not most of these black and brown kids trying to get a degree, go home, make some money, plain and simple. All right. So let me stop there. Oh, let me talk about a couple, couple more things we move on. All right. Um, um, what we got? Uh, all right, that's it. Let me stop there. We will we'll, we'll go to question and answer. Because I've said a lot. Okay. Um, Dr. Moore, uh, thank you very much um, for that talk. Uh, it's been a very valuable talk on these issues in which many of us need further education. It's eye-opening to hear your experiences and get a further glimpse into systematic racism. Mm -hmm. And for those of you out there who didn't take Dr. Moore's class over the summer, uh, Dr. Moore was generous enough to hold a history of the Black experience class for staff and faculty, and also generous enough to uh, load all of that information um, into YouTube videos. So I think I have like 13 friends and family members who took the class wow. alongside me since I took the class. So if anyone would like to hear more, and uh, no pun intended, um, please just email me and I will, I will set you up, get you all of all right. the things. Let me say to Stephanie, we lost black kids in the STEM fields with school integration. We lost them, that, that was it. And black teachers before the schools were integrated, black teachers said, it's not about our kids sitting next to a white kid. There is no automatic process. There's no osmosis process where black kids get smarter. They said, when you integrate these schools, what's going to happen? The black schools are going to get shut down. Black teachers and administrators are going to get fired. And we are going to lose. We are going to lose black people to the entire teaching profession. So if I, so my mom had black science teachers all the way growing up, but when they, integrated the schools, you had about 50 to 60,000 black teachers nationwide that lost their jobs. The principal at the black high school may have become, at best, the assistant principal at the middle school, if not a teacher at the middle school. So that's where we lost a lot of that. That's why you watch that movie, Hitting Figures and all that kind of stuff. A lot of those black women grew up in all black schools where they had, you know, all the teachers are black and administrators are black. And there was a long tradition of black folk uh, in the sciences going back to George Washington Carver and stuff like that. All right, I'm sorry, I just want to throw that out, Stephanie, I'm sorry. No, thank you very much. Um, so we'll open it up now for q and I believe the chat feature is enabled again, but also, you know, unmute yourself. And what questions do you have for Dr. Moore? Carlos, I think you had your hand raised. Yes, yes. Yes, I hope you can hear me because I'm using my cell phone. Um, yes, we can yes, hear you. Uh, Dr. Moore, I want to thank you so much. I, I attended all your lectures during the summer. Thank you. And uh, it, was, it was greatly uh, impacting my life and uh, the ones around us. I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, and I want you, your sincere opinion and reply about this the way you always do it. The uh, UT uh, Austin leadership is predominantly white. Our college's leadership is white. Mm -hmm. There's not a single black in the leadership. There's not a single minority in the leadership. When we recruit professors and we bring minority faculty to be recruited, they're always put on the, under the same footing as the white um, applicants. They don't, people don't tend to understand what you said very clearly, which is, the history, the background of the black people, the history, the background of the Hispanics. Mm -hmm. So bottom line is that they're all put on this, the same part and they say, well, we have to recruit, we have to select because of, of um, impact, because of credentials, because of all the, the measures that you see. But mm -hmm. consequently, what we see is what I just said, the leadership of the college is white. Most of the leadership of the university is white. We are about to choose the provost and we're about to choose the VP of research. How can we change all of these in a practical way? Not in 10 years, but in the next four to five years. 
Carlos, that's a good point. You know, the one thing I tell search committees is that your, 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 your process doesn't just, it doesn't work like you think it does. Because if it worked, no, everybody would get tenure. Nobody would get denied tenure. It would work out, but it doesn't, right? And so I tell people all the time, I treat everybody fairly, but I don't treat everybody the same. And what I found, and I don't, and I don't have any scientific data, but what I found is that often when uh, black and brown candidates are being recruited for academic positions, is that too many of our departments, Carlos, take this, what I call the Michael Jordan theory. And let me explain what that means. If we're, if we're trying to hire somebody at a senior level, what I have found, this is just me, is that we want to get the blessed black person. We want to get that black person from MIT, from Stanford, from Michigan. They're not coming. And I remember having this discussion with a dean. And I, he said, well, yeah, Leonard, we tried to get, I said, that person's not leaving Harvard to come here. And my point was, I said, when I look at your white faculty, they didn't go to those schools. But it seems like, in some ways, it's crazy. It seems like sometimes the bar can be higher. Second thing I'll say, Carlos, sometimes we have to adjust our criteria. We have to adjust our criteria. I think racial and ethnic diversity is vital. I, I mean, it's not, it's not an add-on. It is vital. You can't call, I don't think you can call yourself a cutting edge department if those views aren't represented. If they aren't, if those views aren't on executive council, if those views aren't, aren't in department or college meetings, I just don't. We've got to be willing to own and recognize our biases. When I, when I do leadership training, what I do, I do exercise where I pass out a resume, identical resume to everybody in the room, and I can tell by what your bias is by the first thing you look at on the resume. Some of y'all gonna look at name of the person. Some of y'all will look at where they, where they got their degrees from. Some of y'all will look at, well, what school they're teaching at now. Some of you will look at, first thing you look at is where the reference is coming from. Some of y'all look at, well, how much grant money they bring in. We all have a bias that we bring to that process. And we need to, we need to recognize it and be aware of it, all right? Because if we are honest, most academics like hiring themselves. They do, we do. And we, we, typically, we, we typically reproduce ourselves and nobody's willing to say, you know what? We gotta do something different here, all right? So that's my take, Carlos. Thank you. Uh, Michael, you have your hand up. Did you have okay, a thank you. Sorry. Okay, first of all, thank you, Dr. Moore, for the yeah. wonderful talk. Thanks, Mike. Um, so you mentioned that there's an issue with the culture in like police stations, DA's offices, courts, in which police don't expect to have accountability for their actions. And so my question is, um, do you believe that the police and justice system as they exist now in America can be reformed? Because I personally believe that police and prison abolition and a complete rethinking of the justice system we have now is the only way to confront systemic racism in an effective way. So I'd love to hear your opinion on this. Mike, I don't think it's that deep. I think it's, uh, we need white advocates. And I think, you know, the good cops need to, I mean, there's this, this culture of protectionism is crazy, you know? But Mike, that's a totally different discussion, man. We can, we can, we can, deal, we can deal with that offline, okay? <laughs> All right. Okay, Eric? Eric, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Moore, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Yes, great, great talk. I have an observation and a question for you. Uh, I grew up in Holland in the 1970s, uh, arguably the most tolerant society in the world at the time. Very little racism, equality of men and women, gay rights, um, abortion was allowed. Um, and coming to the US has been a very strange experience for me. I, I feel that I'm, I've been in a time warp where I've been put back uh, kind of 50 years. Uh, my observation is when I when I came here, uh, I was put into kind of mandatory uh, class, uh, the diversity class, where I was being taught to treat people, to treat minorities equally. And I made the, um, the, the dreadful remark saying, well, shouldn't we regard people as, as equal, right? Aren't they? Should we treat them as equal because they are equal? And this, this sends shockwaves through the audience, right? Because uh, this was all about kind of teaching us political correctness, but not about actually treating people mm. truly equal because we regard them as equal. 
Um, in these kind of situations uh, over the last 25 years in the US, I, I found out that people like myself, kind of uh, uh, tall, white, uh, Caucasian dudes, better shut up and, and listen. Uh, and my question to you is, what can I do to be part of the solution, not the problem? Right. Thank you, Eric. Here, here's what I tell people, Eric. You know, uh, I'm a, I'm a, I've, uh, in former life, I was, I'm a pastor. I still have the calling. I just don't have a church now. But let me get, let me get an example. So, uh, a lot of my white evangelical friends, they love doing these mission trips. Oh my God! I mean, it's like, it's like a, it's like a rite of passage, right? And I remember speaking over at big, big white church in West Austin. Did a little TED talk over there a couple years ago. Uh, and I said, the problem with your mission trip, a, is that you, you are imposing yourself on people who didn't invite you, number one. Uh, number two, you want to go help, but instead of you spending $150,000 to take 60 kids over there, why don't you just send the people you're trying to help $150,000 US? That would go a lot further. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, but the big thing is you, you don't even know what their issues are. You know, and so I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to say, Eric, the best thing allies can do is not assume they know what black people need right ask how can i help what can i help you fight for so about five to six years ago eric eight about ten years ago this is a pre-gentrified east austin i took about 15 students over there i said let me go we're gonna knock on doors for two hours and we're gonna find out what the issues are i said but before we go let's jot down what, what we think the issues are they were like after school programs uh daycare uh more recreational opportunities all that kind of stuff you know what the number one issue was over there we knocked on the doors they wanted speed bumps in the street. You know why? Because a lot of people were flying through those neighborhoods in the, during rush hour, going downtown, leaving down, trying to get home, and they were having kids, their kids and grandchildren, were getting hit by cars at, cars at a disproportionate rate. Here's my point. The only, I would have never known that unless I asked, right? Yes. And that's what too often happens. We don't ask people. So I would just say, Eric, I'd say, what can I help you fight for? as opposed to assuming you know and going to do that, all right? Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm asking, right? I, I know that if, I, I know nothing about question, being Eric. black in America, I, right? I, I can relate to it, but I have no. How many black no, graduate students no. do we have? How many black graduate students do you all have in your college? I don't know. Somebody got to know. How many we got? Amy, do you know? Do we have any? I can think of four or five. Four or five out of how many total? We don't, and that's just any, the top of my head. We don't have any African American students in our department. We have None students at all. from Nigeria, but we don't have any African American students. Not one. In our department. No. Okay. How For many grad students? We have one. Okay. So, Eric, here's how you can help go to Prairie View, go to Texas Southern, and say, I want you to send us two of your best students who are interested in this. We'll take them, no matter what their GRE scores are, we will take them. We will take them. Give me, that you're gonna bring in a cohort of four. That's what you're gonna do, and you're gonna begin to build a pipeline. That is good. Can, can, you, can you connect this with the, the right colleges to be able to do right. that? Right, right but, I'm saying, you gotta, but, but you gotta take the two they send you. No, you know, I remember I was in grad school with a bunch of folk from like Princeton and Georgetown and Carnegie Mellon and Stanford. And they had these high GRE scores. Some of them flunked out of the program at the, after, the, after the first year, all right? And for me, when I'm thinking about grad students, to me, it's all about hustle, determination, work ethic, overcoming adversity, and all of that. So that's, I think that's easy. I think as a college, you all should say, we're going to have at least four Af we're going to bring in four African-American graduate students uh, fall of 2021. And that's easy to do. Okay? Good. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Masha Pradonovic. Oh, was did Glenn have his hand up too? Yes, oh. he's had his hand up for a while. Oh, I'm sorry, Masha. Do you mind waiting for Glenn? Okay, Glenn. Hello, Dr. Moore, and thank you for your uh, lecture. I um, would like to hear from you an uh, explanation of what reparations are and your thoughts on that. Okay, Glenn, great question. So th there's a lot of debate now over reparations and reparations is basically people making an argument about slavery, that you know slavery was state sanctioned, supported by government, and that people are making that a lot of the wealth generated uh, 
through the slave trade, through the institution of slavery, which wasn't abolished to 1863, 1865, is that a lot of that wealth in many ways built America. King Cotton, that is gonna drive your industrial revolution. And that's what makes America, gave America this great economy, this whole idea of American exceptionalism. So the, they're making arguments on that. Glenn, if I were an attorney, I can make a much stronger case for reparations based on Jim Crow and not slavery. Let me tell you why, all right? My grandmother lived in Louisiana from 19, born in 1915, died in 2007. She's like 90, almost 90 years old or so, 92, 93 years old. Her and my grandfather paid taxes every year to the state of Louisiana for schools their children were never allowed to attend, for libraries their kids couldn't go to, for parks their kids couldn't go to, um, for summer programs at LSU and Tulane, the LSU they weren't allowed to go to. So I can make a case that you were taking the tax money of black people, but you were taking that, taking that tax money, but you were using it for pro white private enterprise, okay? And so quick history lesson. You don't hear white Americans, particularly white Southerners, talk about hating the government, not paying taxes. That only happens when the schools were integrated. They had no problem paying taxes as long as all the tax money went to their white own, went to their white country club, went to their white school system, went to everything white, and even a racially restricted job market. They had no problem. They only had a problem paying taxes because when their tax money was going to, in many ways, give black people equal access. So the argument could be made. I could find people in Texas right now who pay taxes through the state of Texas, but who couldn't vote. I mean, black people are effectively, in Louisiana, black people were disenfranchised from 1891, 1895, up to about 1967, 1968. And these are people, Glenn, paying taxes. And we saw the same thing in Texas from about 1900, Voting Rights Act passed 1965, takes a couple years to implement 1967. So my thing is you can't take people's tax money for 70 years build up an entire infrastructure for white people, then all of a sudden say in 1970, oh, it's equal now. Well, it's like, no, it's not equal. It's not. So Glenn, that's the argument I would make if I was an attorney. Thank you. Um, Masha uh, has, asked to, has asked to speak next. So you can't, you can't unmute yourself. <laughs> Uh, what have I done? There we go. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moore, for the lecture. So I would like to uh, get back to um, graduate admissions. Um, but I think the problem we have is actually sort of across the board, because often, to to answer your question, if if Prairie View would send me two of their, I happen to be graduate admissions chair, if they would send me their two best students, mm -hmm not a problem to get in okay they don't even apply okay yeah, so it's 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 a problem of even people thinking of ut mm -hmm. uh i would also i'm also a foreigner so coming from across the pond i also see a problem with uh, u.s americans in general mm -hmm. not wanting to do graduate school that's a whole <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's uh, multiple issues there conflated okay. into one mm -hmm. so but I'm wondering how can we actually try to build those bridges? Because if you go to faculty admissions or faculty, uh, we right now have an open call for an assistant professor in our mm -hmm. department. Okay? Uh, we will often not see applicants, not mm -hmm. even see them. Uh, when we talk of black, we see Nigerians <laughs> often right. or, or Ghana or places that uh, right. typically have oil reserves <laughs> so 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 in that sense we hear Af we see africans but that's a completely different group right so in that sense how do we make that sort of across the board so here's, here's, so here's, we will have uh, so just one more thought uh -huh. because uh -huh. when i ask the students who actually are in the in the undergraduate program uh, that are african-american so they said yes we were here at, in such and such camp during summer and out of 40 students who came to see UT, 10 applied. Mm -hmm. It's kind of that simple. How do we <laughs> propagate that 
up to the upper echelons, if you will, graduate school and then faculty. No, I mean, I think, I mean, the, the, I mean, there are two perspectives. I mean, I mean, I think a very uh, a tried and, and, and proven method is to grow your own faculty. You know what I mean? I'm a bring in grad. And this nonsense about, oh, we're not going to hire people as assistant professors if they get a PhD here. I've never understood that. I've never understood that. I mean, these are things in the academy. We have to begin to question why. You know, if they're talented, they can do the work, they can add value. Why not put them on your tenure track? So what I would say, I like the summer program idea. Y'all got a lot of money over there from, from what I've been told. Set up a summer program, bring about that 30, 40 black down. We say, oh, you know. The money goes up and down. down. I mean, you know, set up a summer program, you know, five to six weeks, bring them in, get them to know the faculty, get them adjusted to the campus, and you got a good shot at getting them to come for graduate school. Also, they have to be recruited. They, you know, stu talented students have got to be recruited. We just can't sit back and say they didn't apply. You know what I mean? You get in the car, go down to Prairie View, 11,000 black students there, go 45 minutes down the road to Texas Southern, got another 11,000 students there. You know what I mean? And so some of it, we have to begin to sort of make an effort and not just sit back, you know, and say, well, nobody applied. Okay. But what I'm suggesting is I think we need to probably do that across the board as, uh, well, engineering an entire UT um, and not just, because some of it is also, I think, uh, especially when it comes to graduate school, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a bit of a, we have trouble seeing U.S. citizens in our program, I got you. period. I, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. And let me say this, too. With these, these, you know, one thing that kind of frustrates me is when academic departments say, well, yeah, if the dean gives us the money, we'll do it. No, this has to be woven into your regular budget. You know, I, I've encountered a lot of departments who were hostile to any kind of diversity initiatives. But when I showed up with the money, they went, you know, they had no problem spending it. And it's like, no, this has to be woven into you know, your, your, your regular, uh, your regular, you know, academic uh, budget. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Masha. Um, Carlos, you have your hand up again. Did you um, want to ask a question? Yes, yes, sorry. I was muted again. Yes, uh, Dr. Murda, sorry to ask again, but nobody wants to ask questions, so I suppose I have. <laughs> Well, I know this has to be diverse, but you know nobody asked more questions, so I hope you don't mind that I ask <laughs> I a second mind. question. Uh -huh. So, you know, this summer, since uh, the incident by George Floyd, we have been undergoing a lot of lectures, the most impressive lectures, of course, the ones that you gave. We have had all kinds of other committees formed. The university has a tendency to stack committee after committee before doing anything. So. So I think that the, uh, the time for studying, examining, and thinking is gone. Now it's the time for action. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. So no, what right. can we do to act and, and diversify the university and enact change immediately? I, I just like starting where you're at in your college. You all can put together a plan. We're going to go to these HBCUs and recruit black students. That's what we're going to do. You know, I call it strategic doing, not strategic planning. Just go do it, you know? get some flyers up, connect with some professors and just go, just go meet students. I think, I think that had that for you all to build an infrastructure, you got to begin to build the infrastructure. And I think that starts with recruiting. If you talk to the women's basketball coach right now, or the soccer coach, they will tell you who the top players are in the 10th grade, 11th grade and 12th grade, who they want to go get. And I think sometimes we as academics that'll take a similar approach. All right. Sorry, I can't be any more specific than that, Carlos. Um, Eric, your hand is still up. Is that from earlier or is that from? Oh, that, that was from, that was from earlier. Okay. That, that was, sorry, that was from earlier. I, w I wanted to make, make an additional statement though, is that what people don't realize is that we all came as the human race, we all came of, out of Africa. Hmm. So we're all supposed to be black. <laughs> now, yeah, when people went into Europe, migrated to higher, higher altitude, higher, higher areas, right? Where there was less sunlight, we lost the pigment in our skin. So white people are mutants. We're all supposed to be black. <laughs> if I were to say that, that'd be on the front page of the statesman. It's actually true. It's actually true. <laughs> right. Thank you, Eric. All right. 
we have any other uh, some other questions out there? Okay, John. All right. Uh, so I'm a student in the department, mm -hmm. and uh, this is the first I've heard of you, and I'm sure I, you probably could answer this question if I would have been in one of your summer classes. Mm -hmm. But I want to kind of go on what you were saying in the beginning of the talk about having different stories yep. and about how we can figure out a way, because when I'm in the department, I exchange you know, with my students. A lot of them look like me, and we have the same story. And we have the same political beliefs, same assumptions, mm -hmm. and we, we can connect very easily. And I, I know that we need to have more of that going on with different ethnic groups. But how do we bridge those two stories? Not, not make them the same, but how do we sit down and talk to each other? Because it seems nowadays, at least in my generation, that we have a really hard time actually communicating as opposed to just yelling at each other and saying, oh, I believe this, you're wrong. You know, I've seen this. How do you not know that? And it's, it seems very difficult to do that when people start at different points initially, yeah. when you have different viewpoints initially. Mm -hmm. And I just see that a decay of that instead of an increase in that. I'm desperately trying in my life to increase that. You know, I've had to confront parents and relatives and say, well, you know, well, I'll give you an example. This past weekend was opening weekend for deer season. Uh -huh. I mean, you can imagine what deer hunters look like. And there's a, only one black man in that area. Where you from? Northeast Texas? You from Northeast Texas somewhere? Where you from? Uh, no, I'm from actually LaGrange, Texas. Oh, LaGrange, Grange. okay. All right, go ahead. I'm sorry. And, you know, a lot of these people that were in my group, they came from a different generation. Let me put it like that. And they were referencing him in, in inappropriate ways. And I, I, I didn't know he, how to approach them he, about that. He's in the group? No, he, he was not there yet. He's a neighbor. Oh. They like him. But they just, they don't have any adversity to him. They're real buddies. But they just casually roll the stuff off the tongue. And I'm like, how do we get to sit down and say, hey, you know, like you were saying, you got to you understand the perspective. You understand where they're coming from. So you can't you can't judge them too, too much or get maybe not judge, but get mad at them. Yeah. I, I see just a real struggle of, of sitting down and bridging those perspectives. And I'd like to see if you have any input. I mean, if they call this dude the N word, man, that's totally out of line, man. You know, yeah, what I mean? it, it was. Now, would they say it to his face or no? No. Oh, okay. Okay. It's funny. It's funny, John. I had a had a white student from uh, Texarkana. Guy's about six four, six five, red hair, kind of like you. You got red hair, kind of like you. And yeah. um, he was a uh, man. This dude, me and this guy got really close. And he said, you know, Doctor Moore. This is a couple years ago, Doctor Moore. You know, um, you know, uh, I don't know if it was deer season or some other season starting. He said, you know, Doctor Moore, deer season is starting. Coon hunting season. Something. He said, my uncles want to know if you want to go hunting with us. I'm like, no, I'm good on that, man. I'm, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing that with y'all. Um, but anyway, uh, stuff like that, John. I don't know. I don't know what you do with stuff like that, man. Some people, some people cannot be redeemed. Some people can't be. You got, you got. Some people cannot be redeemed. They gonna, they gonna be where they are, you know. But I think for us, I think for for your generation, John, and I tell my students all the time, <clears throat> we got to be comfortable being around viewpoints we don't agree with or like. You know, just because somebody says something you don't like doesn't mean they um, doesn't mean they're racist. Don't you know what I'm saying? And that that's what I see a lot from a lot of my students. They're quick to write people off if you disagree on one thing. You know what I'm saying? So we got to be willing to be a little bit more open. You know what I'm saying? And, and here's the thing: after Trump got elected in 2016, me and my wife invited like some of our white neighbors over to the house because I was just trying to understand said, I'm not trying to pass judgment. I, I'm just trying to understand. And, you know, one guy said, well, well, Leonard, I voted for Trump because my boss told me, he worked at Pfizer, since he said, his boss told him this quote, since you're not gay, since you're not black or Mexican or a woman, you're not getting promoted no more. So that's why he voted for Trump. Another person said they voted for Trump because of economic issues. And third person said they voted for Trump because of, um, she felt they were, he would best represent biblical principles. Now, why I disagree with all of that I understand how they came. I understand how they, I understand their thought process. So we got to be willing to sit and just talk to people at times. Yeah, I mean, one more additional point on that is I agree strongly. And a lot of people in my generation really are not comfortable with that for some reason. 
I mean, I see my, I've really changed a lot as I've, as I've gone from youth and what I was taught to believe and what I was shown in front of my face. And now that I have different access to information, I have almost become comfortable with changing viewpoints. Right. And but John, listen to this, John, the guys you went hunting with, where, where do they get their information? Where would they, where would they be? Give me an environment where they would be around people who disagree with them. There's not one. There we go. There's not one. So sometimes you got to be patient with people. You know what I mean? <laughs> All right. Patient is a virtue. Thank you, John. Um, we're going to go to uh, David DiCarlo now. I'm trying to unmute you. OK. OK, here. So, so like, nice to hear from you, Dr. Moore. Um, especially my, my wife went to high tide. She graduated in 1987. Come on, man. Dead. Are you serious? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You, you, you guys were there at the same time, I assume. Yeah, she probably finished two years before me. Man, that's crazy. Yeah. Okay. She grew up on Staunton. I don't know what part of Heights. Heights. Tell her I grew up on. Tell her I grew up on Lee Road, right by Liam Mayfield. Yeah, right by Liam Mayfield. Yeah, so I'm very familiar because yeah, I went to Case Western Reserve and I grew up in North Homestead. What year did you finish at Case Western Reserve? I finished in 1987. Man, my dad finished in 1955. <laughs> <laughs> Delivered so, mail. So, it wasn't as yeah. elite as it wasn't as elite as it is now. You know, when they would call asking for money. He said, no, he said, I went to the case when it was like a city college. He said, you know, yeah, yeah. he said, so call some of your recent alums to get those big checks. He said, because I don't have no more money. <laughs> I, I guess, yeah, that's interesting. So but my question is, my, my wife went to high tide. And I know it's, 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 it's got a big population of Jewish. Yeah. People, big population of black Americans, big population of white Americans. And, and, and she's a white American. Um, oh. But just how did that kind of shape you? Or how did that, did you find working there with all these different groups all by equal proportion at Heights High. Um, Man, does that David, I love that we had people at our high school. I tell people we had some people going to prison and some people going to Princeton, all under the same roof. You know what I right, mean? Right. Yeah, it was yeah. just it was just man a dynamic I mean, it was, it, was, it was dynamic. I think when your wife was there, Heights probably about 50 percent black when your wife was there. You know what I mean? But um, <laughs> It was just, man, it was just a dynamic place. And I don't remember ever race being an issue. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I don't remember any anti-Semitism coming from, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's just everybody was just like, hey. Yeah, yeah, I just, yeah, I don't remember that. I'm not trying to say it was like leave it to Beaver, but I don't remember right, 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 any, right. you know. <laughs> but it was really the only, the only Northeast Ohio like that though, basically. That's right, that's right. Are you a Browns fan, David? Uh, unfortunately. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Moore, we have a question in the chat. And um, the question is, Dr. Moore, what do you think about, about the response, like all lives matter to the Black Lives Matter movement? Here's what I would say. Um, if I go to a, what's, what's the race for the cure called? Cumin or Coleman, what's it called? Susan G, what's it called? Susan G. Komen. Susan G. Komen, Race for the Cure. All right, so let's say I showed up at the race downtown Austin and I started yelling at people, talking about what about prostate cancer or all cancer matters, right? What would they say? They'd be like, yeah, but this is a breast cancer walk. No, like, no, uh-uh, uh-uh, all cancer matters. That's how foolish it sounds when we hear all lives matter. That's like me coming to... Um, John's birthday party and saying, no, everybody's birthday, everybody's birthday matters. So it's foolish. And it's only a response to Black Lives Matter and the Blue Lives Matter. Nobody was saying that before. So those are in many ways um, politically loaded statements, right? Designed to minimize the impact of Black Lives Matter. And nobody else suggested, nobody, nobody was suggesting other lives didn't matter, but we're talking in this case that Black Lives Matter. So that is sort of my response to it. Okay, thank you. Um, Masha, did you? Am I unmuted? Yeah. So I just had the sort of ideas with uh, what John mentioned. And I think those are the conversations that are always difficult, especially when you find yourself in the environment of your family, often older family members, where there is a power imbalance, right? 
So you are always supposed to listen to them, right? And so how are you going to actually tell them something? Right, right. I think that this crosses any issue, and particularly this one. But I think that idea about monopoly is a powerful one. So some sort of games and co true conversations with phones mm -hmm. down. I made that comment in a chat. The right. problem right. that we have intergenerationally right now is that nobody's listening to each other. We all have, we're all tied to our devices, but that's, uh, so bring some sort of situations where you can make small inroads by making implicit statements. Mm -hmm. So try to play a game of Monopoly. Let three mm -hmm. of your family members <laughs> be disadvantaged at the beginning. Right. Yeah. And then after the, all is said and done, say, by the way, <laughs> this is how it is for a lot of people in this country. Right. No, I think that's a good point. I think that's Games a good point. Games and uh, humor, humor as well. I think we're kind of forgetting that humor also helps in bringing things. Um, but again, it's just the how do you broach difficult subjects with those that don't. Right. But then again, also you have to be patient with how much inroads can you make with your 80 year old, right. any relative. And John, John I'll say this. <laughs> so work um, with your friends, really. John, often a group setting is not the best time to bring it up. Yeah, one on one. You'd be like one on six, you can't win that. And then you got to, you know, get in the pickup truck one and individually and talk that way. All right. Well, good luck, man. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, let's see. Looks like. Okay, you're, I'm trying to unmute you. Uh, okay. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, first off, uh, uh, Dr. Moore just wanted to say thanks for giving such an insightful presentation. Uh, I caught your university lecture series presentation. Oh, thank just you, man. Really hooked by your speaking style. Um, thank you. When you were talking about, you know, uh, persecution from the police, it kind of spoke to me because uh, my mother, uh, so I'm Puerto Rican and um, she lives up in Syracuse, which, okay. you know, college down, but college town, but like predominantly white. And she's dealt with a lot of, you know, uncertainty with just driving police, harassing her, things like that, you know, and it's just, it's like a really frustrating concept for me to deal with. Cause I just know that, you know, with like my complexion, like it's something I would never have to worry about, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, I guess my question just has to do with like, you know, how can we show more compassion and empathy, you know, towards, you know, people in your position and, you know, just people who have to deal with that kind of persecution. You know? Here's the thing, man. When I, when I was speaking out there at Lakeway Men's Club, I took them through a, a series of questions because I was trying to get them, I had to guide them where I need them to go. You know, I think I started off the question, but like, you know, if any of y'all ever had a bad football coach, they raised their hand. You know, any of y'all ever had a, like a bad business partner, they raised their hand. You know, y'all ever had like a bad uh, teacher, they raised their hand. I said, how come you all can admit every other profession has bad people except the police? <laughs> and I don't know why it, I don't know, it's, you know, it's, it's just admit that, you know, we just come to the immediate defense of police. It's like, they can do no wrong. And I'm like, no, they are people, you know what I mean? They are people, they don't make a lot of money, they are not most well, they are not well educated at all, you know what I mean? But these are the people we're putting out there in many ways to, for, for law enforcement. So um, I will say this, man, Chief Carter, UTPD, he's doing some good stuff. He's doing a lot of good stuff. He had me, a Latino police officer, a Latino police chief from Pflugerville, sister Latina, and he flew down a white guy from Washington, D.C., and we interviewed a group of officers who were going to become captains. And he said, I want you all to mostly ask questions about, um, you know, like community policing, race and policing and things of that nature. So he's doing some good stuff on campus. You wouldn't know it if you looked at him, but he's doing some good stuff, you know, behind the scenes and trying to really, you know, bring that department along. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Is that it, Stephanie? We good? Oh, Lisa, Leah? I had, a, I had one really quick question for you. Um, so first off, obviously, thank you so much for coming to the department. But what um, black activists do you follow, or follow their like on Twitter or things like that? Because I'm I'm following a lot of voices, and a lot of them are some are 
further radical, like prison abolition. And then some of them are more like, no, we just have to make this work. So as far as Black voices for us to listen to right now, even outside of academia, who would you suggest? I think Van Jones is pretty mainstream. Um, uh, I don't know. I tell people, you know, Leah, I mean, because some of the people, you know, you see with like large social media followings, they're not really doing the work. You know what I mean? And so, but you know, I know some of these people. I'm like, you're you're hustling the people. You know what I mean? But I would say Van Jones, and I like Angela Rye, R Y E. I think it's the last Angela Rye. Mm-hmm. I think they're uh, because here I tell people, black folk are black folk are not super far left. Black folk are actually a little right of center. To be honest, they're a little right of center. You know, still rooted in the church a great deal. You know what I mean? So real big on family and values. And one of the reasons you saw more black men vote for Trump this time than last time is because there's this idea that the Democratic Party is hostile to black men and black families, all right? But that's a totally different discussion, all right? But I'll say Van Jones and Angela Rye, I really like them. I really like them a lot. Mm -hmm. I mute myself. Uh, This has been a really excellent talk. We so appreciate your time, Dr. Moore. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I guess we're just about out of time. So again, thank you for being here. Thank you for everyone who came and, um, you, Dr. Moore, when you go back, you'll already see you have emails from me with asking your permission to <laughs> share the recording, <laughs> but no problem. Uh, fine. you can get back to me. Thank okay. you. Again. Thank y'all so much. Thanks thank everyone. You. Bye.